<laughs> okay, hello everybody, again. Um, all right, I'm going to talk today, and you'll see the question mark on the end, about global macrobiotics. Now, when I started macrobiotics at the ripe old age of 20, one of the things that attracted me to the whole movement was the idea that we could save the world. I mean, the food was great, and I really loved it, but the bigger picture was what attracted me and kept me going. Um, in recent years, I've worked with people from all over the world. And what's interesting is that almost none of them know anything about macrobiotics, have never heard about it until they've come into my office. So it, oops, it got me to thinking, I have to put the thing in again. It got me to thinking, is macrobiotics really global? So I'm just going to go through a few things. It's a huge topic, so I apologise. I can't go into every aspect of it. So that, you know, I'm just trying to stick to a few things. Um, okay, this is a map of the 12th century trading that went on throughout the world. Um, the reason I put this up, it's interesting to look at how foods were traded. They went from town to town to village to town and they became adapted and adjusted to the culture. Actually, we've been trading since prehistoric times and this is one of the ways that humans communicated. It was early communication. Um, so this trading map just is interesting in the way that foods and products moved. Osawa was actually pretty remarkable. In the sense, and here again, I'm only really focusing on the dietary part. He adapted a simple rural diet from Japan, and he sent it from the east to the west. Um, but what's interesting is, and here's a little map, he sent it straight from Japan, over with his students, of course, to the west. But what about these countries? I'll do my little stick. What about this Africa, <laughs> Russia, Kazakhstan, China? We, it moved rapidly from one side to the other, which is pretty remarkable in the sense that it got adapted. But what's interesting, and it's just a little thought I had, is that going back to how humans you know, took foods into their own culture and adjusted it, did we really do that with macrobiotics? I know we have macrobiotics in Spain, and we have it in America, and we have it in England, but how different did we develop those? Did we make it really English-style macrobiotics? Or was it you know, American-style that was put into Spain and people tried to make that? Or is it still Japanese-style, trying to make it Japanese? I know lots of us are on Facebook, and there's huge arguments between people trying to decide what macrobiotics is and what are the right foods. But really, it's fantastic if it's Spanish style macrobiotics, and it's even better, if, well not better, it's just as good if it's English. Because that means it's become part of that culture, of that community, of that, of that climate. Now, is this where macrobiotics has got a bit stuck? Many people associate macrobiotics with products. They're fabulous products, we all know that. They are powerful, they can make huge change. But has it really limited macrobiotics to say that you know we need to have miso and kuzu and umeboshi and um, amasaki? Are these products defining macrobiotics or is it something else? And it even goes further. Some people recommend very specific products. You can only have a certain type of sea salt. But the problem is there's lots of young people out there that are interested in health and this puts them off because they can't afford it, for one. And it becomes, from the outsider, a bit of an exclusive club. I've heard this from people, you know, oh, we're only in wealthy people, it's only in wealthy countries. What about all the other countries? You know, so this is this limiting. I'm asking questions. I don't say that I have all the answers, but I'm just asking the question. Or is macrobiotics this? A wide variety of plant-based foods, which we use our macrobiotic principles to adjust and adapt to the countries we live in. So we might make it a Danish style macrobiotics using these, the foods that are available and adjusting them with the principles that we have to hand, which is the gift of macrobiotics in my opinion. Um, going back to this map, what's really interesting is that botanists for hundreds of years, even more, 
have engineered and adapted foods. So foods that we think of as net, you know, indigenous actually are not. They've changed incredibly over the years. So we have to really decide what is indigenous. The meaning means originating or occurring naturally in a particular place. But seeds have been, like I said, been traded and manipulated for thousands of years. Um, so this is me up a mountain in Spain, <laughs> eating sauerkraut from Russia, bread from Germany, and peanut butter from America, which is pretty cool. You know, you can see, you can adjust it. It was very good for that climate, and it made me feel great. But you know, is this a good idea? Maybe it's a great idea. Have we done it enough? Have we included foods from other countries rather than just Japan? Are we using foods from India, you know, or, or from um, Africa? Are we using any of these foods, or are we looking into them, or you know, encouraging the people who live there to use those foods? It's important, I, I feel, um, to look at a country and to understand the culture and the foods that are grown there and how we can again use our principles rather than thinking that we have to, they have to do a huge change, the wholesale change of a complete diet in another country. Um, this is just showing, I actually rather love that picture, but anyway, um, greenhouses, you know, we have this thing, it has to be local and seasonal and it has to, you know, grow where we live. I used to live in Philadelphia. I can tell you, in the winter in Philadelphia, I wouldn't be eating much. It's cold there. What are you going to grow? You could store things. You're not going to get any greens. I used to grow veggies, you know, I'm sure everyone else has done. You're not going to get many foods. You won't get anything growing in the winter when the snow is up here. So those foods were stored, you know, and used throughout the winter. But we're not really doing that in macrobiotics. People tromp off and they get their greens in the middle of the winter, and then we go off and have other foods. So, and, Actually, Portugal's probably one of the places that I almost ate totally local foods. The climate's fantastic here, yeah. and I used to get everything from the markets, and I never felt there was a lack. But yes, it was seasonal, so some things I didn't get. But many countries, you can't do that. And greenhouses go back to the Roman era. Um, Tiberius, Tiberius, I think it is, he wanted cucumbers all year long in Rome. So he decided to develop a kind of greenhouse. They didn't have glass, they had mica, which is that very thin, kind of almost like slate, and he built coal frames that were heated. So we can see that in terms of foods, you know, even back then, which is BC, 42 BC or something, they had greenhouses. Things were being manipulated and changed. In other places, this is a pear tree, it used to be grown against the southern wall to protect it from the, from the cold. And often um, manure was put, you can see a little bit, manure was put over the roots because the manure keep, kept it, keep, you know, the heat to keep those, those uh, specific plants or fruits alive. And then, you know, they became the, the lean-to and the orangeries. But even for us now as macrobiotic practitioners or people that enjoy, you know, a diet, are we actually really eating local, indigenous, whether we, we know what indigenous is anymore, you know, seasonal foods, because obviously it's been changed for a long time. And one of the examples I want to give is carrots. Does anyone know where carrots originated? From Holland, of course. Oh, no, they were transferred from the orange. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Orange. They went orange. Carrots came from Afghanistan and Persia, Iran, originally. About, yeah. I think it was. Yeah. Originally, I think they were blue. Purple. They were purple. 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 They were all different colors: black, purple. They were very woody, extremely bitter, and they were considered medicinal. Um, they were very good for sexual vitality. They, that's what they were known for. And they, they spread quite easily throughout the world. I mean, I naively was like, oh, you know, England, they had carrots forever. But actually, no, it came from a hotter climate. But over the years, they manipulated the taste. They manipulated the color, manipulated the, they got rid of the woody taste. And yes, the Netherlands actually developed the last orange, the orange carrot, which was 
In the 13th century, they were cultivated in gardens and fields of France and Germany. In, 19, in 1609, the settlers in England started cultivating <laughs> carrots. But the 17th century is when they were, they changed the look, the flavor, size of ancient carrots to produce the modern orange colored carrots. And it was first in the Netherlands. So there we go with carrots. We all eat carrots. And actually what's really interesting in America, carrots were not popular in, in the kitchens, you know, just everyone's kitchens until World War II. It's not that long ago. And World War, the reason they became popular then is because the soldiers saw how the English were growing carrots in their gardens and that the, it, they you know, saw the value of these carrots and kind of encouraged them back. They grew in America before that, but they just weren't really used. So again, they're more recent. And actually now you can get some of these old, other colors coming back and they are more bitter, I think. <laughs> just one thing about sauerkraut, which I thought to say, a little bit of trivia for you at a party when you don't have much to talk about. Sauerkraut was used by Cook on his voyages. You know, we always hear about the scurvy news, but actually Cook, of course he was British, but he used uh, sauerkraut <coughs> to help with the scurvy and also to prevent gangrene externally. So that's interesting. Um, this is just buckwheat. Um, the reason I put it here is because a lot of times we think of buckwheat as, as coming from a cold climate. And, you know, the Russian word is grichka, which means from the Greek. And it's used in India a lot, because we get people from India, and it's really used a lot in India as well. So, again, we have to be quite clear about where these foods are coming from, you know, without sort of attaching labels. Okay, this, these, I'm just going to go through some countries, because I see these people <coughs> quite a lot. We see a lot of people from different countries now, and it's really important to try to figure out how to present macrobiotics. Okay, I see people who have a lot of money, so it's fine for me to say you can have miso and take kombu because they can afford it. But in the actual country, a lot of times they'll say, oh, we, we'll, we'd never have that. I mean, you're gonna get seaweed in Saudi, let's be honest, you know? Um, and so, what do we do about that? Yes, we know these foods are powerful, but are we actually, is it a good idea to use them? Or, you know, how do we see that? So, Saudi was nomadic until the 19th century. <coughs> it's not that long ago. They lived on, they, their foods were actually based on um, goats, sheep, and camels. A lot of it was dairy food. They did do trading as well for other products. They do, uh, they did have grains now. Um, and of course, and I tell this to clients when they say, oh, but my traditional diet, and I do explain to them, you're not living a traditional life anymore. You're not a nomad. You're not living in tents, you're in a city in air conditioning. So of course we have to adjust the diet, and they understand that. But um, it's still interesting to see how recent um, this lifestyle was in Saudi. And now um, they use, if we look at the sort of the healthy part, they use a lot of soups and stews, a lot of beans, fool is one of them, um, tabbouleh, you know, bean salads, hummus, dates, of course, we know about the dates. Um, what they, they use coffee, but it has cardamom and other spices added. Um, what they can grow is cucumbers, melons, eggplant, oranges, greens, cabbage, cauliflower. That's pretty much it. And they are quite good with grains, wheat, millet, sorghum, and barley. So that's one. I was, di oops. I was dying to sneak in a picture of Borat, but I thought maybe it'd be a bit. <laughs> I understand Borat in Kazakhstan. This is Kazakhstan. I'm not sure why it's. Do you know why it's not? Should I leave it anywhere? Okay. The reason I use Kazakhstan, you know, it's, well, that's a bit weird, but it's not actually because a lot of, we get a lot of people from Kazakhstan coming to Shah. And Kazakhstan is the largest landlocked country in the world. It's a huge country. It's really a huge country, and it was a big part of the uh, Silk, Silk Road. But these people are wonderful. They're incredibly strong. They have constitutions like you cannot imagine. And they love macrobiotic food. Um, I just had a guy 
and he, they, him and his wife, they've been, I think this is their third time, and they really love macrobiotics, they really enjoy it. But they both said to me, in the winter, it's really difficult not to eat some animal food. They really find it hard. It's so cold. But it's not just cold, it's like dry and cold. Traditionally, again, a nomadic society, um, they lived on horse meat and camel meat and also breads and dough, like a flatbread, things that, they could, that would last a really long time. Um, this ended in about the 18th century with uh, Russia when they colonized it. Um, I've talked to people from Kazakhstan and they can get a lot more things now, which is good, but they, it's hard for them to find greens there. Um, broccoli maybe five months a year. A lot of the foods come from China and they don't like to use those foods because they, they feel they're icky. Um, so they have to import quite a bit. Even the beans, just you know, dried beans are very hard. So it's, they don't use them, they tend to import if they have beans from somewhere like Italy. Um, a lot of pickles. Really, they use tomatoes as pickles, apples, um, squash pickles, of course, sauerkraut. And the easiest oil is unrefined sunflower oil. Um, so, but they're very open. Funny enough, I would say Russia, Kazakhstan, um, Poland, all those countries love macrobiotics. Um, if we go to Russia, they always want to hear about it. It's really of interest to them. And whenever they come to, to Shah, they love the food. I mean, they just, you know, it's very easy for them. The Saudis, it's a little different. They're not as keen. Um, okay. And then India. India's really interesting. I think we have, many of us have a somewhat blinkered view of India, that it's a sort of hot climate. It's not. It's extremely diverse. I had a great guy who lived with me in Philly, and he said every um, area has its own style of cooking, and it's very specific, so you know which area you came from. And the north is really cold. It's like the Himalayas. Mm. So, you know, we've, we've missed out a lot in, in, in their incredible history of cooking and different, you know, use of foods. All these are pickles here. They use a lot of pickles. Um, of course, lots of different herbs. They, they have buckwheat and millet, and they use them in different ways. Um, they use different oils depending on where it is, from peanut oil, coconut, sesame, mustard oil. A lot of the spices came from Portugal. Um, actually, you know, of course, we're here. It's the best, best food in the Gamma, is it? Yeah. Okay. He, he changed a lot of how the world um, viewed food. His exchange, he was really, really a big part of it. So we're in the right place. Um, a part one region of India has Arab, Syrian, Portuguese, Dutch, Jewish, and Middle Eastern influences in their diet. So it's incredibly diverse. Um, has a wonderful history, and you know, like many of these places, I mean, interestingly enough, it, people in England, they love Indian food, <laughs> and you would think it's not suited to that damp climate, but they love it, and you know, again, has it adjusted, you know, wait and see. And then Africa, now Teresa and Anna McKenzie probably know more, much more about this than me, but we are getting people from Africa, which is super exciting. Um, it's an enormous continent, incredibly diverse, so we can't really say, oh, well, this is all African-style food, because it depends where you are. Um, Nigeria, we get people from Nigeria, and I'm told, you know, for the, just the regular people, you, can't, you can only really get palm oil or ground nut peanut oil. You can get olive oil, but it's very expensive. Um, they use, oil. It, yeah, it depends where you are, though. Some places you can't get coconut oil. Because it's, you know, just a very rare. And of course, there's no berries, there's no, you know, low sugar fruits. Some apples, but most of it is, you know, um, star fruit and bananas and mangoes and oranges and lots of different greens. They use nightshade greens, manuka, manuka? Um, amaranth greens, spider plants. Um, they make a lot of things from starchy vegetables, pounding, lots of, again, lots, stews are like universal. Every, every country in the world uses stew. I, I always suggest to people, if they really, you know, 
if they're going to cut back from meat twice or three times a day to once a week, make it as a stew with lots of veggies. Um, I know some people don't agree with that approach, but I can tell you, if I was if I made it more hardcore, those people would be completely turned off. And I've had people come back who actually became vegan because of that approach. So, you know, sometimes we need a step-by-step -step for people. Um, okay, also lots of beans, black-eyed peas. They ferment carrot pods, locusts. They call them locust beans. They make flat breads, millet pancakes, a fermented fish, sourdough dumplings. So there's lots of different interesting things. Um, and so, in looking at all these different countries and how foods are being used, I think we can ask ourselves the question, have we really reached far enough yet? You know, I think we all know that macrobiotics has incredible power. Uh, that's not, you know, that's indisputable. But have we actually used it in a way that is more embracing to people from different countries, more embracing to young people, What's really great, and I know I'm not meant to mention where I work, but anyway, we're getting much younger people coming. We have a lot of people now coming in the 20s, 30s, and not because their parents are sending them, because they really are interested. Um, but, you know, I think in terms of spreading macrobiotics in, throughout the world, I don't think we're really doing a great job. I'm not saying, you know, because people tend to live in the country and that's good, but I think we need to really work to look to see how we can make it more embracing, more encouraging for other countries so that people do hear about it. I and mean, we do have a gift, and it's like to share it. It's important. So I think I did look at it. Well done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you want, you've got five minutes for questions. If anyone okay. Does ask anyone want questions. to ask me a question? <laughs> Does anyone want to ask me a question? <laughs> Shocked into silence. Oh, yeah? You want to ask a question? Oh. <laughs> Well, funny enough, they're all pretty similar, actually. It'd probably be more different with the vegetables. Um, in terms of stews, I mean, they use it in Russia when it's really cold. A lot of times it's a combined protein, so it could be a fish stew with beans or a meat with beans, and then other different vegetables. But depending where it is, those veggies might change. Could be, and it uses some oil. So in a hotter climate, you'd have, you know, more the tomatoes and, and peppers and onions. Onions are very universal, <laughs> but uh, in and other countries might have pumpkins and you know beetroot and things like that. Yeah, but you can you can go from just beans to you know combining. <coughs> Let's get someone to ask a question down there so you can walk down. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you talk about the um, really free loop to the Asian. With the, the, what we consider traditional is not traditional. And the traditional at the end is, is the forgot, forgotten of the woods, as I, I understand. Um, but this is a paradox for us. So, um, should we go so far to understand what we should eat in our climate, or we, we I don't know, we put the that the perspective to to the present, and with the conditions that we have, we do the best now. So yeah. Well, I think you know, um, with and Bill talks about this a lot. It's important is that. We, where possible, we want um, to have foods that are, you know, local and seasonal because it's more sustainable, more ecologically sound than having it travelled. But I think what we do have to understand is a lot of the foods that do grow may not be actually indigenous, but they've adapted to be suited to that culture. And people are very 
comfortable with their culture and the way they do things and their cooking styles. So my point is to make use of that, to use our macrobiotic principles, to use the wide variety of exactly. plant-based foods to make it suitable for that culture. But, you know, of course, oh. as much as possible, still using what's local because of the, you know, environmental aspect. The first idea Sustainable. Was, was because of the, of the night shadows. And most of the time we say because they are tropical, they have this kind of... <laughs> yes. But you know what's... They are here for, for a long time. You know what's quality. interesting with tomatoes? Are they actually, they grow pretty well in a lot of places if it's hot. In the summer, you know, they, they all grow where other veggies won't grow. Because I remember one hot summer in um, Philadelphia, I wasn't growing some tomatoes, but my neighbor was, and they were fantastic. My greens were looking really sad, and it was just way too hot. And those, you know, kept going. But yes, they've, they've really adapted. I mean, they were probably teeny before, and, you know, England thought they were poisonous, and they just used them as table decoration. And so they, there's a lot of adapting going on. The pickled tomatoes are probably one of the better ways to have it. But it's again understanding how to use tomatoes and if it's necessary and the climate. Yeah? I think then what's, what's I tried to do some uh, research about nightshades and it turns out that tomatoes are the most adaptive and whatever the soil that is high in nightshades is minute, the more ripe the tomato the less it is. Potatoes are still the highest, especially on white potatoes, and especially if they sprout. So it seems the range of what's hard for about nightshades, potatoes are the most, tomatoes are the least, and others are somewhere in between. So you know, uh, from my experience, tomatoes, for many people, work really well. Potatoes are the most. There was, there was a, an event about uh, tomatoes. Steak. steak. Sorry, no steak. <laughs> I, I was, it was an event in Spain about tomatoes and just for the number of varieties in the Peninsula Ibérica, more than 400 tomatoes. Yeah, that don't tomatoes. exist in other parts of the world. And peppers. So. Just one quick last thing about tomatoes. Yeah, I just want to, you know, I think that really, you know, when you look, even in the Mediterranean area, when tomatoes were first being used as, as food rather than a decorative plant, they were always really prepared rigorously. They were really cooked a lot, the seeds were taken out, the skins were taken off, you know, and, and really. They just cooked the hell out of them, you know. I mean, 24 hour cooking was not unusual for making a sauce uh, out of tomatoes. And I think it really makes, I mean, I found anyway, it makes a huge difference when that's there. The acidity just like drops like crazy. I heard uh, a few months ago an interesting study that's done on the University, I think, in Holland mm -hmm. to see what the reaction of plants is to human habits or to animal habits in general and they came to a conclusion that some plants are trying to avoid to be eaten by animals and they found so far i only remember two but at least two of them is that either they develop toxins so that the animals don't eat them and so they can proliferate and grow further and grow on you see or they develop uh, very spicy taste. That was a defense. Because especially the mammals, huh, they eat anything you can say. And in order to defend, the plants defend themselves because the, the, the mammals digest the seeds. And so that the plants will die out. You see? And so that was their trick, you may say, to be able to get rid of being eaten by by mammals, mm. by making it spicy or by making it toxic. There was a turkey, but I forgot about that. Yeah. And, and yeah. spines. Yeah. You know, it's prickly. Yeah. That's another good tip. <coughs> this is interesting that you mentioned this with this uh, defense factors the plants have developed. And there is one one material that is called uh, lectins. And lectins also is, is in nightshades. We found in nightshades, and you all know in, in very many things else. 
I have the question now in the nightshade, tomato has less lectins perhaps, and is less, uh, uh, other lectins really transported and gone to perhaps uh, destroyed when they're cooked very long, or what is going on with the tomato in comparison to the potato, because the potato has certainly enough lectins that we, even from this uh, reason, we don't want it. Uh, my understanding is that the, the, the lectins disappear very quickly with cooking, right? and some of them disappear when you soak beforehand. For instance, grains have lectins. In the, when, you soak, when you soak the grains, uh, particularly if you discharge the water afterwards, uh, the, the, the ratio goes down very, very rapidly. It's a solanine, I believe, from right here. It's a solanine that's the problem with, you know, it exacerbates inflammation. And so that, that's, that's the only real problem with it. It's just that, that quality of exacerbating inflammation. So if people have gout or they have arthritis or anything like that, and if they're, if they're using tomatoes regularly and they stop, they get instant improvement. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, I think what Bill said, I mean, as far as food preparation and combinations, it takes care of it. But if you're interested in the details about lectins, Colin Campbell did a paper that's totally readable. So if you Google yeah. Colin Campbell and lectins, so in plain language, she debunks it scientifically. It's fantastic. Yeah. All right. And just Colin Campbell. Yeah. Yeah. Colin Campbell and, and and just and just one thing in to fact, without the stick, right? I think everybody should just subscribe <laughs> to the Cornell Nutrition yeah. right. newsletter. You know, just subscribe to it. It's an excellent yes. nutritional source. Just a thing on you know with tomatoes. Also, I'm a if we understand about balance and everything, I know we used to put miso in it, you know, to been cooking for a long time. Also, it's very good for some people to help discharge animal food. So, you know, again, using it more in a medicinal way. So that's it, guys. Thank you very much.